Colossians 3, 1 to 11. So if you've been raised with the Messiah, seek what is above, where the Messiah is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with the Messiah in God. When the Messiah who is your life is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, put to death whatever in you is worldly, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, God's wrath comes on the disobedient. And you once walked in these things when you were living in them. But now you must also put away all the following, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his practices and have put on the new man who is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of his creator. Here there is no Greek and Jew, circumcision and uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, there's a sermon outline there in your newsletter on the left-hand side. Uh, household questions, top right. Hold your Bibles open. If you've got page 1006 marked because you want to relearn that memory verse, we'll turn to Romans 12 uh, later on. Uh, one of the things that's really struck me in life uh, is how often sports people now don't talk about the results, they talk about the process. I, I don't know if you've noticed that, but sports people are all focused on the process. I don't know if that's uh, helping them get used to the fact that they keep losing or winning. I don't know. But they think about the process. Uh, you listen to the interviews with a gold medalist after an Olympic event. Uh, what was going through your mind on the blocks? I was going through the process. Uh, you talk to people as they uh, come off the field at halftime at State of Origin and they're puffing and panting and some person's put a microphone. What do you think about for the second half? Process. Uh, what do I have to do? Uh, what are the steps I've got to take? Uh, the result will look after itself. Have you heard that before? The result will look after itself. I've just got to do the process. Uh, we're coming to the process today. How do you make decisions in life? How do you make decisions in life? What's the process that's set out for us as people who are connected to Jesus? Christ and conscience, Jesus and making decisions. Let me pray and we're going to dive into it together. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, thank you for its clarity. Uh, thank you uh, for the people who wrote it under your influence uh, with your spirit flowing through their quills. Uh, Father, thank you that it's been preserved. Father, we make decisions all the time. In fact, at the moment, we, we're making decisions. We pray that our decision making will be connected to Jesus and so transformed. Amen. So I'm at point one on the outline. How do you make decisions in life? Have you ever actually just sat down and thought through your decision-making process? We make decisions about all sorts of things, don't we? You're making a decision at the moment. Do I write down that word? Do I forget that word? Bernard speaks too quickly. Can he slow down? We make decisions on everything from borrowing money through to our sexual identity from politics and energy prices through to whether or not I'll respond to that telemarketer asking me for money, from why I have a certain view on racism through to what I understand success to mean, from what's a fair wage through to where will I invest my money. We make decisions all the time, don't we? Have you thought about how you make decisions or why you make them? A decision-making, as far as I can work out, and this is Bernard Gabbett's kind of guide to decision-making 101, you've got three areas where you make a decision. First, you've got to work out what life's about, don't you? What's the good? What's the purpose in life? How should it work the best? Once you've made that decision, and again, you've got to think through how you make that decision, don't you? You've then got to work out whether that's good for everyone or just for you. Is this a community thing? Is this the best good for everyone or is it just my good? 
And then once you've worked out what the good is and who it's for, you then work out how to get it, don't you? And what have I got to do to get there? And there are many ways you can deal with that first part, the good in life. What's the best version of life? What's my best life lived now? You've seen that phrase, haven't you? You could say that life is good when it's free from pain and suffering. The good life is the comfortable life. It could be the pleasurable life. It could be the life that is successful, however you decide what success is. It could be a life that's free from boundaries and constraints. It could be my life. What I decide is true and good. Whenever you decide one of those is what life is about, you then make certain decisions, don't you? Is that for everyone or is it just for me? And then you go and get it. Now, let me give you an example, just choosing one of those. I've come to the conclusion, this is an example, okay? Do you hear me clearly there, an example? I've decided that life, the good life, is about comfort. I've come to that conclusion and worked out that it's really about individual comfort. For that reason, knowing that comfort is expensive in this world, I need to make a certain decision about my university career and my employment so that I can afford my comfort. I can afford a certain type of house. I can afford a certain type of air conditioner. I can afford a certain type of shoe. I can afford a certain type of car, a certain type of holiday, all which are comfortable. Do you see how it works out? In those three steps, going through the process, a life's full of decisions all the time. And as we make them, we're making a decision about what the good life is, aren't we? And then we're working out how to get it. Now, it seems easy on one level or or exhausting when you think, I've got to do that for every decision, including wheat bix But when you actually burrow down into it, there are some significant problems for our decision-making. A Colossians touches on them. And the first problem that this little letter from Paul to God's mob in a town called Colossae, the first problem is, I'm a human being. And as a human being, I've got a certain type of nature, haven't I? It's called human nature. You've heard that phrase in the way people describe things. If you look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, it tells me that by nature I'm a citizen of where? The domain of darkness. If you remember what Ben was talking about two weeks ago as he finished off that sermon series on Jesus in Colossians 1 verse 21, because I live in the domain of darkness by nature, my behaviour is evil. My mind is damaged. I'm alienated from everyone because I'm God and you're not. If you're listening to Psalm 51... A poem written by a man who was confronted by his decision making. A man who decided what the good life was and went and got it by murdering, lying and committing adultery. You'll realize that in Psalm 51 verse 5, humans are described, all humans, as sinful from the time of conception. So there's a fundamental problem with any decision making, isn't there? It's my nature. I'd love to take my nature off like a set of clothes, but it'd be pretty bloody and messy, wouldn't it? Every part of my decision-making as a human being is broken or damaged or warped, the Bible says. In parts of the Bible, my mind is described as dark because I live in the kingdom of darkness. I don't know properly because I want to be God instead of God. It means my mind is misdirected. It means my body is misdirected. It means my behaviour is misdirected. And the consequence, it's an alienated and alienating world. And that's because of who I am. The second problem emerges from the world we live in. Not only am I broken, but the world's broken. Oh, we know that, don't we? <laughs> I mean, we feel that after every soccer game, and that's just soccer, let alone touch football, let alone relationships and families, and gee, we're trying to get to church on time. 
In Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 21, which we looked at last week, we're reminded that the treasures of this world last how long? Temporarily. You see, I'm making big decisions about a world that's going to pass away and so too will I if things stay the same. So not only am I broken in every part of who I am, in my mind, in my heart, in my behaviour, in my body, in my relationships, the world I live in is broken (laughs) and damaged. And so I'm making these big life decisions about things that are going to disappear. Let's go back to that example that I gave you before about life being comfortable. Remember that example? Uh, The good life is the comfortable life and that's about an individual and I'm going to go and get that because it's expensive through my uni degree and earning money. What happens when I lose my job? What happens when it becomes a bear market and everything starts to crash and my investments and interest rates all seem to conspire against me? What happens when my mortgage repayments climb through the roof? What happens when the comfortable shoes that I like wearing are too expensive now? My medical fund goes bankrupt because it invested money badly. Energy prices are through the roof, so my reverse cycle aircon doesn't work anymore. And the rising fuel prices mean I don't drive that comfortable car anymore. And that doesn't even take into consideration the rising medical costs I will face as the football games I played in my youth now mean I need knee replacements. And my shoulders are damaged and my medical fund is now bankrupt. And that doesn't even take into consideration that my neighbours want the same comfortable life and their interests are butting against my interests. How do you make decisions? How do you make decisions about the good? How do you deal with those two fundamental root problems of my nature and this broken world? How does Jesus fit into all of that? I'm at point three on the outline because obviously there needs to be a circuit breaker in there. Some change needs to happen. And the change is a change that we're told about in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. If you've got your Bibles open, uh, turn with me there. It's a change that concerns my transfer and my transformation. God has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. As human beings, we need a transfer. We need a postcode change. Do you remember that series and that great picture that Neil drew about the postcode change moving across the river? We need that. We need rescuing. We need to be reminded that we're not God, but there is a God. That when we become God... We move into darkness, but that God loves us so much that he wants to transfer us back to him, back to his presence. And how does he do that? By his boy. Did you see that there? He transferred us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. Down in verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself by making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Our sins can be forgiven. That blackness that we have chosen to dwell in, where we have said we are God instead of God, God says, I still love you. I'm going to deal with your blackness, your darkness by sending my boy whom I love. He'll live the way you could never live. He will die what you deserve. He'll be raised to show that you can now change postcodes, be transferred, be forgiven by a real man. And when you receive that by trusting in what God has done, you are completely transformed. It's the ultimate makeover, isn't it? It's a wonder no one's made a telly show about it. You're taken from hostile to God to in God's family. You're taken from being alienated from God to being friends with God. You're taken from being evil to blameless. 
from malicious to faultless, from an enemy of God to acceptable to God, and that then also transforms the world around you. Jesus doesn't just transform people. What he did will change the world forever. And you're completely remade if you're connected to him. And and that will actually change your decision-making. You're a completely new person. Uh, That decision-making change is in the reading we just had from Colossians 3. Make sure you're there with me. I'm at point four on the island because there are a number of really significant if-then statements. If-then. Look there in verse 1 of Colossians 3. So if you've been raised with the Messiah, seek what is above, where the Messiah is seated at the right hand of God. Did you get the if and the then? If you are connected to Jesus, this is crucial. You've got to be connected to him. If you are connected to Jesus, if he has changed your postcode and transformed your nature by his life, death, and resurrection, if you are forgiven because he died for you, then where is your life? It's connected to him. It's connected to him. Did you see how he's described there? What's the title he's given a number of times there? It's Messiah, isn't it? That's a really big term saying, this is the king God promised to take you out of darkness. Where is Jesus now in those verses? He's seated at the right hand of God, above all the universe, because there is nothing that can defeat him. And so that's where your life is, connected to him, connected to who he is. If that's where your life is then, look there at verse 1. Then seek what is above, where the Messiah is seated at the right hand of God. Look at verse 2. If you are connected to Jesus, set your minds on what is above, not on what is on the earth. Your life is connected to the bloke who runs the universe. The one person who lived as we should have lived. The one person who obeyed God perfectly. The one person who rules everything. So that's where the good is, isn't it? If he's the one who deals with the domain of darkness, if he changes your postcode, if he transforms your nature, if he offers you forgiveness from sins, if he is seated at the right hand of God, there's the good. There's the good. And you're connected to him. Do you notice in those verses, that means your past is dealt with and you live in the present with a future? And so when you think about that three-step decision-making process, remember that from the intro? What is the good? Who does it apply to? How do I get it? We've dealt with the first two already, haven't we? What's the good? The good is a really easy thing to find out. It's shaped like a bloke called Jesus. (laughs) That's the good. That's how life is properly organised. And it's for who? It's for both the individual and the mob. That's why we sit together like this. Each of us deal with God through Jesus and we're brought into a community with God and with each other. And that completely changes us. That's why we had that memory verse. Let me remind you again of our memory verse. Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, there's Jesus. I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Your bodies match his body because they're so inseparably connected. Don't be conformed to this age. Change your decision-making process because you're connected to Jesus. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you may discern what is the good, pleasing and perfect will of God. Because God is single-minded in his love for you, you can be transformed. Because God has sent the good in flesh, you can be changed. Because God is single-minded in his mercy, your decision-making can be renewed. You are commanded, if your life is connected to Jesus, to seek that good, the good that is shaped like him. 
Now, the common accusation at this point, I completely understand it, is, well, that's terrific, great pie in the sky stuff, Bernard. Typical of Christians, you live with your head in the clouds. You present me something that's airy-fairy, but I want something practical. (laughs) I want something concrete. I want something tangible. Do you notice where verse 5 in Colossians 3 goes? Did you notice that? You're connected to Jesus who's seated in the heavens. Seek what is above. Verse 5, therefore put to death whatever in you is worldly, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. Can you get a more concrete verse that deals with the mud and the guts and the blood and the gore of this world? If you're connected to Jesus, you make immensely practical decisions about everyday life. Decisions, if you look at that verse, that cover everything from your sexual identity to how you respond to ads on television to how you read the catalogues in the Sydney Morning Herald on a weekend to how you deal with your investments. Do you notice that? Because you're connected to the bloke who rules the universe, you make practical decisions every day of your life. And they're shaped by the good That is Jesus. You are completely new because you're connected to him, so live like it. Make decisions in line with that. That's what Drinda was picking up earlier on in the kids. So as as it goes further, take that off. Get used to your new you, which is shaped like Jesus because you're being renewed in the image of your creator. Your future set. One day he's going to come back. Everyone will see that he's the most significant human being that's ever existed. And because you're connected to him, your life matches his shape. To have your life in Jesus means living the good life now by making practical decisions in his shape by making practical decisions in his shape. So that's the third part of the decision-making process, isn't it? What's the good? That's Jesus. Who's it for? Everyone in a community. What's that look like? I make practical decisions in every part of my life. It's summarised in verse 11 of Colossians 3. Look at it there with me. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcision, uncircumcision, barbarian, Syrian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. It's trying to make you realise if Jesus rules the universe, as, as Ben pointed out two weeks ago, if Jesus holds the universe together, if Jesus created the universe, then this isn't just a way of life for people who have faith. <laughs> this is a way of life that works for everyone connected to Jesus. It works for everyone connected to Jesus. So so what does that look like? I'm at the last point on the outline. What does that actually look like? Well, let me tell you that the first step is to actually know Jesus, isn't it? You've got to be familiar with him. There is no better place to start your decision-making than opening up one of his biographies, Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. That's why we're spending eight years looking at Matthew. So every year as God's mob, we spend time just with Jesus, hanging out with him, because he's the shape of the good life. Uh, When you do that individually or as a group, there will be an invitation time and time again, won't there? Are you connected to him? Do you know him? Do you trust him? Because without him, your life is cracked. It's in the domain of darkness. It's broken. So I suppose that's the first question to ask. Are you connected to Jesus? Do you know him? Do you know his goodness? The transformation that comes from him? Because as you know him, your whole framework for decision-making will be transformed. Uh, Let me take you through a number of very quick examples. A move quickly, okay, write quickly, or re-listen to the talk this afternoon. Uh, Matthew 5, 21 to 26, Jesus helps you understand how to make decisions about anger management, conflict resolution, and the way in which to repair fights. Uh, Matthew 19, 1 to 12, Jesus talks 
about our sexual identity, who we are as men and women, what relationships look like, why singleness is so good. In Matthew 22, 15 to 22, Jesus describes how to deal with your taxes. Jesus describes how you treat people. Jesus gives you a decision-making process for politics. A Mark 10, 35 to 45, Jesus deals with power imbalance, how to avoid a bullying culture, what we do with the power granted to us for the good of others. Uh, Matthew 8, 5 to 13, 15, 21 to 28, Jesus deals with racism. What to do with people who are of a different colour or a different ethnicity? Uh, In Luke 10, as Jesus sends out his followers into the world, Jesus sets up an ethical framework for decision-making when it comes to wages, payment and employment. Everywhere you go in the biographies of Jesus, you get decision-making in his shape. Uh, We could just go on and on and on, couldn't we? Let me encourage you to read a biography. Open it up and meet Jesus. And when you do, and I'll finish with this, when you do, you realise that he's called the Messiah for a purpose, not just because he's a Lord and Saviour, but that that's God's promise, which was made how many years before him? And so when we view him that way, we don't just deal with our decision-making with the four biographies of Jesus, the rest of the Bible's unlocked. And our decision-making strands go all the way back, like it does with Jesus, to Genesis chapter 1. Jesus is the good. Get to know him. And the process of your decision-making will be transformed. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. We've really kind of um, looked at some big things this morning, Father. Uh, we thank you that you simplify it down to this. The good in life is shaped like Jesus. We can be connected to him and so be transformed by being forgiven by you and having our minds, bodies and souls made new. Please help us. Be connected to him by trusting in what he has done alone. And please continue to transform us. In his name we pray. Amen. Any questions? Baxter. Baxter, that is a corker question. Okay, so for the people at home, uh, it's really hard to make decisions and to be conscious of our decision making in the middle of something, isn't it? Uh, Especially a fight or an argument. Uh, Let me go back to athletics, okay, or or sport. One of the great things that athletes talk about in process is muscle memory. Okay, if you do things enough, I I don't know what the figure is, I think it's 10,000 times repetition to get something automatic. Okay, Uh, that's how long it takes an athlete to do that uh, with something. So think of a long jumper, a a double hitch kick in the air. If you've ever tried a double hitch kick, go down the park and try it. Uh, You'll fall in a knot with a broken hamstring if you try it just once. But 10,000 times you'll get it perfectly and you'll probably jump about seven metres. It's the same with our change as God's people. Uh, We know the thing. What We were told there in Colossians, you have got a completely new person. The rest of life is getting used to that. It's learning the muscle memory of who you now are. And God gives us three really good things to help us do that. First of all, he gives us himself. His spirit is with us. The spirit works in us through God's word. Uh, It's remarkable if you spend time daily with God in his word, how often his word will come up in the midst of those moments where you think you can't make a rational decision, like in the middle of an argument. Uh, Augustine said virtue uh, are just habits practised. And then he gives us his community in prayer. And so we rub off against each other as we meet and we pray together. And so Baxter, yes, 
You, you won't bite your tongue every time. Your father's a good example. But as God works in you through his spirit, applied through his word, as you live as a mob by praying, the muscle memory of getting used to the new you will start to take effect. And do you know what? Then you'll discover other sins you've got to deal with. And then the muscle memory will kick in with that. Yeah. Does that answer your question?